you are scared of the opinions of others that, frankly, they don't pay your bills. They don't call to check in. They don't see how you are. They don't see how your family is. Yet you're afraid of what they think about you. That's got to go. That's got to go. I'm going to be talking to you about the fear of man. Okay, it needs to die. It needs to absolutely, unequivocally, without a doubt, just die. Okay? It's demonic. It's got to go. I got some notes here. I just want to hit some points real quick. So what is the fear of man? What is it? Well, it's, the, it's being afraid of man. Okay, it's a little more than that. Okay? I'm going to read it to you. The fear of man is the fear of losing the approval, love, or friendship of others. It is often an idol of approval. Oof. I'm coming for the people pleasers today. All the, all the people pleasers are going to be mad at me today. <laughs> it can also be described as the fear of what others might think, say, or do. They don't pay your bills. Why are you afraid of them? Why do you need them to say good job when they don't even give you money to pay your rent? They don't call to check in and see if you're still having panic attacks. They don't call to ask you how you're doing. Something happened. There's been three things happen in your life, major events, and they haven't called to check in. Yet you're scared to do what God's called you to do or pursue that desire in your heart because you fear of what they think. You live in a small town and you know everybody knows everybody and they're all in each other's business and you don't want to do that one thing that is kind of an anomaly and separates you from the herd because you just want to be a good little boy and stay within the confines of your small town. You want to reach the limits of what your family has reached, not really exceed that because other people will talk about it, have something to say. You're kind of known in your school, in your work, in your job, in your town, and you're just afraid. You're afraid. You're afraid. Meanwhile, you're too busy pleasing people and not pleasing God. Bro. You know what it really stems down to? You know what it comes down to? It comes down to identity. You actually don't know who you are. So you have all these desires in your heart that you really want to pursue, but you won't do it because of fear. You're scared. You want to just follow the pack, right? Um, and you have these desires. They're God-given desires, but you're not pursuing them because you don't really, your identity is not fully in who God says you are. You know, you go to church, you say all the right things, you do all the right things. You act a Christian, yet who God says you truly are, you don't really believe it to the point where you can separate yourself from everybody else and do what he's calling you to do. Mm. Okay. Okay, cool. And that was me, y'all. That was me. I still struggle with the fear of man sometimes. I do. But you know what happened? And I hope y'all can take me seriously with this toothbrush. You know what happened? What happened is God isolated me. He took everybody away from my life. You know what happens when he takes everybody away from your life? You have nobody to please but God. And in those moments when, when he isolates you, he speaks life into you. And he lets you hit a point where you have no one but him. A lot of y'all think that all these people are actually for you. But in reality, you have no one. They're just acquaintances. They don't call to check in. They're not real relationships. They're surface level friendships that maybe you see at church, maybe you see at work, maybe you see at school. Surface level. And you want to please that over God? Nah, dude. It needs to die in order for you to step into the purpose that God has for you. And the purpose is another video, but, but the definition of purpose is just the reason something was created. Colossians 1.9, I'll dive deeper into it, but it says all things were created in him and through him and for him. Your purpose is just to live for God. And now there's little assignments that God will ask you to do, gifts that he's given you, burdens in your heart that he wants you to pursue, but you're too scared to do it. There's no one else in your pack is. So you're just going to settle. You're just going to settle. Or maybe you think you're not good enough. You're not talented enough. And so the fear of man is limiting you from growing and learning through experience. The, 
guys, I make, I make music, right? I write music, I make videos, I make content. I didn't just magically get good at it. it took time, experience. So identity, right? Who are you? Answer that question. Who are you? If your immediate answer didn't go to a child of God and you just said your name or what you do or your occupation, no, you're a child. You're a child of God, first and foremost. How does that dynamic work? Well, it works like this. You have a father who loves you and he wants you to just pop up on his lap and let him take care of you. That's, that's, his, that's easy. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how much theology experience you have. I don't know how often you are. I don't care how, how you were raised in the church. I don't care how much experience you have in, 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 in church. I don't care if you're a pastor. There are pastors that don't even consider themselves children of God. They just consider themselves teachers. And their title has taken over them, their true identity, which is a child. If you don't see yourself as a child, we got a problem. You got to step down, pastor. You got to step down. You're a child. And I say this with passion because, number one, I had a coffee. <laughs> and number two, knowing that I'm a child actually keeps me going. Because when I get caught up in overthinking on what's next, what am I supposed to do? What is this or that? Or something happens. Like I, I just go back to the simple truth that I'm a child of God and Jesus loves me. It's not complicated. Your child, your son, your daughter, your son, your daughter. And we have access to a father. But there's a lot of Christians, especially in American Christianity, um, that um, they don't look at God as a good father. They look at him um, as a judge. And although God is the only one who can judge and will judge us when we die, that's not a good relationship to have with your dad. That's not sustainable. So what happens when you don't know who you are, when you don't know that you're a child? Well, you get your identity from other things. And you still walk around calling yourself a Christian. But you let the enemy form your identity. You let other people form your identity. You let heartbreak form your identity. You let church hurt form your identity. You know how many people I went to church with that literally their whole identity now is I deconstructed and left the church. That's called bitterness. It's called bitterness. Y'all don't know I've been hurt by the church. The church is just people, broken people. Why do we why do we expect such perfection from broken people? And we don't turn to God ever. We don't turn to God. Meanwhile, God's up there like, I'm waiting for you to come to me. I'm sorry. I know they hurt you. That was not an accurate representation of me. But yet we, we, and this isn't everybody, but like at least people I know that only know American Christianity, that only know mega churches, that only know cultural Christianity, people that, that only know cultural Christianity and they don't have a true revelation of Jesus and know the God as father, bro, of course you're going to be bitter. Of course you're going to be bitter. Because... The only picture of God that you know is, is the one that America formed for you with their big lights and their lasers and their mega production. And meanwhile, God's actually in the hidden place. He's three miles over there by that river under that tree. And you just got to go over there to seek him. He's over there. Proverbs 29, 25 says the fear of man brings a snare. A snare is just a trap. Fearing man is a trap. Okay. But whoever trusts in the Lord is going to be safe. Hmm. Safe. You know, a big thing that shapes our identity, a lot of Christians too, which is why we have powerless Christians walking around right now is actually shame. It's actually shame. Shame shapes the identity of a lot of believers these days. 
You know what that does? That voids the cross of its power. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for me. Oh, but God won't bless me because I still struggle with this one sin. Yeah, no, God won't. Uh, he won't intervene in my life because because that thing I did five years ago. But I'll go to church, and Jesus loves me, though. He loves me, and he's good, but he's just kind of disappointed. Huh? Huh? What? Why do we look at Jesus on the cross as an event that we're separated from? Why, why is that an event that has nothing to do with us? It's, it's just him. Well, because he, he died for our sins. He, he, he did it. He did. I didn't do anything. Right. Right. But he also rose from the dead, right? And yeah, he, ro he rose from the dead. Yeah, so I believe it. He died for my sins and I'm just still a sinner. No. No, you're actually, in, you're actually a new creation, as Paul would say. In Romans, the old man is gone. The new man is here. For you were once dead in your sin, but now you find yourself alive in Christ. You're alive in Christ. So not only did Jesus die for your sins and raise from the dead, that was your penalty he paid. Right, yeah. Yeah, those... That was my penalty. Yeah, your penalty. He, you're supposed to be there. Right. Right, yeah, he died for my sin. And then he rose. What do you mean? You're not identifying with the cross. You're not identifying with it. It's just, it's just Jesus did this thing for you, and you're just a wretched person, and you'll continue to be wretched. No, you're actually alive in Christ. That's our new life. That the event on the cross is our identity now. We're a new creation in Christ. What does that mean in Christ? Like my like I'm my body's inside his body? No, no, you're missing it. Listen to this with the Holy Spirit. Okay, don't don't listen to the words and try to logically figure out what I'm saying. You're a new creation in Christ. The old man is gone. It's you have to you got to identify with that. You have to identify with what what's happening on the cross. Like Jesus, yes, he is taking the ultimate penalty. He lived the perfect life that you or I could not do it. He died and went down into the depths of hell and then raised back to life. And guess what? You're involved in that. Your identity is involved in that. But I didn't die for my sins. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying he was raised to life and he calls us now. He reconciled us to the Father. So now we are co-heirs with Christ. We're co-heirs. We're allowed to sit at the table now. We're welcome at home now with the Father. We're sons. We're righteous now. I think I get it. I think I'm, a, I'm still a little confused, but I think I get it. <laughs> sit on that. We are co-heirs with Christ, as Romans would say. Co-heirs. Which means we are just as worthy to sit on the table now of righteousness. We are just as worthy, just as Christ is, because of his penalty. Oh, I think I get it now. So like, I'm, I'm really clean. Like right now, I'm really clean. Like, like whatever I did yesterday or today, like I'm clean now. Yes, you're clean. That's your identity. That's your identity. So when you have that as your identity, how are you going to be fearing man out here? Well, because, because Betsy knows an old version of me that used to party and do some pretty messed up stuff. So I got to put on that version of myself for her. No, you don't. No, you don't. Well, my boys back in college, like we did some crazy stuff and they were my best man at my wedding. So I kind of got to be how I was back then in front of, no, you don't. Your new creation in Christ. Act like it. Act like sons. This isn't act by doing better. This is act that you're a son. 
Act like you're welcome in the house. That's easy to do. Wait, so you mean like just don't sin? No, no. Be a son. You're a son. You don't believe you're a son. You, you call yourself a Christian, but you don't think you're a son that's welcome at the table that's made righteous. You still think you're dirty, wretched, nasty, disgusting. You were that. Now you're made righteous. Mm. That's identity. That's identity. You're new. Does it mean I have to talk different? No. Does it mean my personality changes? No. It just means you know dad now. It just means you know dad. And dad knows you. And when you identify with that, you don't identify with the former self. That, that, that boy is done. That girl is, is gone. It's like, it's like, um, it's like, a like shedding old skin. You know, those animals that shed their own skin, like snakes, when they, when they just shed a layer, like that's, that layer is the old self. And that new skin is you knowing who you are in Christ. Right? Right? Not the best example, but you understand. Okay. Shedding the old layer doesn't mean do better. Shedding the old layer means knowing that you don't identify as your old self anymore. Why? Because Jesus died for that man or that woman. He died for that. And guess what? It's buried. You were buried with Christ. You probably haven't read that part of the Bible. Go read it. You were once buried with Christ. Dead in your sin, you're buried with Christ. And now we share in the new life in him. Bro, it's actually crazy. And I didn't know about this for the longest time following Jesus. I always thought I was going to struggle. I always thought I was just going to be this wretched thing that struggled with X, Y, Z. No, dude. New life, bro. It's sick. It's really dope. It's really dope. And it changes who you are. And guess what? Now I can talk to the friends that know an old version of me and I can be the righteous man that God always saw me as because that's who I always was. Oh, <laughs> it's so dope when, when the Holy Spirit reveals it to you and when you have a revelation of Jesus. Y'all, I'd encourage you, go, go turn the lights off, put music on and behold Jesus. Just behold him. Close your eyes, behold him, think on him. Watch the Holy Spirit reveal Jesus to you. Watch him reveal himself to you. It's insane what that does. It's insane what it does. So now... We don't even care about fear, man. Where did that go? <laughs> Out the window? I think we probably forgot we were even talking about that. <laughs> uh. So Satan will use shame. He'll let it creep up and, and you just have to put on that new identity every single day. I heard this testimony from a guy that um, uh, he said he was struggling with watching some stuff on the internet. Probably shouldn't be watching. And Jesus appeared to him and he shut the computer and he told him that that's not who he is. And he placed a robe around him and a giant ring on his hand and a, and a crown on his head. He said, this is who you are. Immediate freedom. Immediate freedom from, from that stuff. That's who we are. That's who we are. It's not a work harder, do better gospel. It's a you're now righteous because of what Jesus did. Dude, he really did that. He really paid that price. And now we can all be free because of it. It's really insane. And now we don't care about the fear, man. Now it doesn't matter. Go do what God called you to do. Go do it with joy, with optimism, with faith. He's going to bless it and be in it and guide you through it. Let's go.